So we're in this Harvest Time series. We're in week four. And the title of the message is Living with Good and Bad. And I will invite you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. That's where we'll be today. And while you're turning there, I want to remind us of our Harvest Time verse. And it's where Jesus asked a question. He says, Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. He's saying, just open your eyes. Here's what he's saying to his disciples. Guys, just open your eyes and look. The harvest is all around us, y'all. Just, uh, we just need to open our eyes and look. The message uh, living with good and bad. So both good and bad exist in our world. I know I won't get an argument on that. As a matter of fact, if, if you watch too much of the news, you're convinced that there's way more bad than there is good, aren't you? And, and, and here's the thing. Here's the problem with that is that when people feel like there's just so many bad things in the world, you know what they do? They begin to question the existence and the goodness of God. So what they'll do is they'll ask a question like this. They'll say, well, if there's a good God, why does he allow bad things to happen? And you know what? That's a fair question that deserves an answer. And so this was also a question in Jesus' day. And we're going to look at Matthew 13 and see how he addresses this question by teaching a parable of the wheat and the tares. And so, in introducing that parable, he begins with this phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like. So to understand the parable, we must be sure that we understand what he means by the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? So I want to give us an understanding of the kingdom of heaven as we begin this message. And, and I've got four points about it. The first point is this, the kingdom of heaven is different from heaven. It's different from heaven. The kingdom of heaven is the expanse of God's kingdom, however far it reaches. But heaven is a holy place in his kingdom. All right? And, and then the kingdom of heaven exists throughout the world, but heaven is separated from the world. So you see the difference there? Another point, the kingdom of heaven exists here and now. The kingdom of heaven is it's not a kingdom to come one day. It's a real kingdom today. In Matthew 13, we see this phrase seven times, the kingdom of heaven is like. And six of those times, what he's doing is he's talking about, he's making a comparison to the world here and now. And so he's, the, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven here and now, not a kingdom of heaven to come. And, and so the third point is that our home, in, our home is in heaven, but we're kingdom citizens on earth. We're already, if you're a believer, you're a kingdom citizen because the moment a person's saved, they become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven the moment they're saved. And so that's how we know that God's kingdom reaches to this earth because he has citizens of the kingdom all throughout this earth. And, and being a follower of Jesus, the only true king makes you a kingdom citizen. Think about this. Kingdom citizens are no longer citizens of this world. Before you become a believer, you're a citizen of the world. When you become a believer, you're a citizen of heaven. Listen, 1 Peter 2.11 says, we're sojourners and we're pilgrims traveling through this world. First, in John 17.16, Jesus' prayer tells us that we're not of this world. And in Philippians 3.20, it says our citizenship is in heaven and we're just waiting on Christ to come back. So we're kingdom citizens. We're not citizens of this world. And here's the last point. The kingdom of heaven is intertwined with the world. The kingdom of heaven is clearly, it's meshed together with the world. It's throughout this world. It's the reason that we know that there's both good and bad. The good is, is represented by God's kingdom on earth. We're the light in the darkness, right? 
And so that's the, that's the reality of it, is that we're intertwined with the world. And it's important to understand that because it's key to the parable that we're about to read. Now in this parable, Jesus is speaking of God's kingdom on earth. And he's talking about all the difficult challenges of living as a kingdom citizen and being tangled up in all the realities of the world. Is that difficult for you? It is for me. It's difficult to try to be a kingdom citizen and live in this mess of a world that we live in. Somebody was talking to me yesterday and was saying, you know, it'd be nice if the Lord would just come back today. If it just, and it would be, except for we have loved ones and, and we want to linger for them. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So why the parable of the wheat and the tares to answer that question? Now remember from a couple of weeks ago, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so we need to understand that. So let's begin with the earthly story that is it beginning to explain why there's both good and bad in the world. The earthly story begins in verse 24. It says, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Now here's the heavenly meaning. It's in verse 37. It says, he who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. That's referring to Christ. The field is the world that the seeds are being sown in. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, kingdom citizens. And it says, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. So here we are in a world where God sowed his seed, his children, his kingdom citizens into this world. That was the intention of this earth as we know. But then Satan comes along and he sows his seed, his tares, those that follow him. And so we have this battle on this earth between good and evil. And it says that uh, the, the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And we see back in verse 25 the enemy's opportunity to do this. Verse 25 says, While men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. While men slept. That gave the devil an opportunity. Listen, if you're asleep spiritually... Don't be surprised if the enemy comes in and takes advantage of your life. We can't sleep on the enemy. We need to be awake. We need to be watching. We need to be aware because he's looking to come. He's the roaring lion who wants to steal and kill and destroy. We can't sleep on that. Too many Christians are asleep today when there's this enemy that's running around and sowing tares into the world. The great parliamentarian Edmund Burke said, The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. we got to quit doing nothing. So why does God allow bad among good? That's where this uh, parable is going. This is the question Jesus is trying to answer. Why does God allow bad among good? Verse 26, But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, Then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? Now see, there's the question. You know what they're saying? They're saying, God, if you're good, why are bad things happening? If you sowed good seed, why are tares showing up? That's the question that we all wrestle with. I've got to admit, I wrestle with that question sometimes. God, why is this happening to me? You ever ask that question? Why is this happening to me? That's the question in whatever form it takes. Why? Because God's kingdom and the world are intertwined. That's what we read, verse 26. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. It's all intertwined together. We're in a world with tares as kingdom citizens. Why? Because the enemy is at work in God's kingdom. Verse 28, he says, and he said to them, an enemy has done this. 
Yes, this is the expanse of God's kingdom, but an enemy has crept in and wreaked so much havoc and and has sowed all these tares into the world. So we must understand this. When we're asking that question, whatever form it takes in your heart, God, why me? God, why this? God, if you're good, why bad? Here's what we got to remember. God didn't do it. The enemy did. The enemy did. We got to hang on to that thought. Man, the enemy would love for you to blame God. He wants you to blame God. He will put doubts in your heart to get you to say, why, God, if you love me, why? No, right there, clearly we said an enemy has done this. An enemy. So, here's the next logical question. Why does God not just weed out the bad? Why didn't he just weed it out? Well, we go on in verse 28. It says, the servant said to him, they asked him that question. Do you not want us then to go and gather them up? You want us to just weed them out? We need to get rid of these, all this bad. In verse 29, but he said no. He said no. So why does God not want to just weed out the bad? Why not? Because the Lord cares about the saved. That's one reason why not. Look at verse 29. But he said, no, least while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Now, what if right now God come along and he just weeded out all the bad, just ripped it out of the world? How many of your loved ones? How many friends? How many neighbors? How many co-workers? acquaintances that we know that don't know Jesus, that are so far away from Him, if God come and just ripped them out, how devastated would we be knowing their fate? He doesn't do the weeding out because He cares about believers. But not only that, He doesn't do the weeding out because He cares about sinners. Listen to 2 Peter 3.9. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why he doesn't weed them out. He's long-suffering. He's hoping that they will hear him, that they will feel the drawing of the Holy Spirit in their hearts and that they would give up and that they would come to him. He's waiting and he's hoping with open arms saying, come home, come home, come to me. That's why he doesn't just weed out all the bad. He cares about believers and the hurt we would feel and he cares about the lost because he wants them to be saved. He's not willing that any should perish. And so then the next question comes from verse 30. It, and here's the question. Why is weeding best left for the harvest? Look at verse 30. It a, he said, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And so God does have a plan. He is going to clean it up one day. But he's long-suffering. He's not willing for any to perish. So he's waiting until the harvest time. And he'll just take care of all of it during the harvest. That's what he's saying there. Why? Well, first of all, it's because young plants look so much alike. You know, when young wheat and tares grow together, it's hard to tell them apart. And, and here's the thing, by the time they are distinguishable, you see that picture right there? They look a lot alike. By the time they're distinguishable, they have grown together and their roots are intertwined. They're all in the same garden. They're all in the same field. Those roots are intertwined together. And any attempt to pull up the tear, it might uproot and harm the wheat. And so it's best to wait for harvest and separate them out. Then, now, now think about this, how this parable, this earthly story has a heavenly meaning. Think about our elementary schools full of sweet, loving little kids. I mean, if I was working in school, I think I'd want to work in elementary. Because they're still sweet for most of them. 
They're still sweet. You can't hardly tell them apart. You can't look at kids in elementary school and go, oh, that's a tear and that's a wheat. I love my little wheats, but I hate my tares. You can't, you can't do that. I mean, the younger they are, you, you just, I mean, they're so innocent. They're so sweet. You know, by the time we begin to really realize and see the difference when they mature enough to where you know who the wheat is and you know who the tear is, they, their lives are so intertwined that it would not be wise to try to pull them all apart. It just wouldn't be wise. You know, if we attempt it to pull them out, then those wheat children would be hurt. It's hard for me to even think that some child is a tear, but you, you, you could say they're a terror, right? <laughs> that just come to me. I know that was funny. Um, But, but imagine now trying to weed out the tares at the age of high school or college when it's becoming more obvious who's living a sinful life and who's trying to follow Christ. It's more obvious, but imagine trying to separate them at that point. Think of the friendships that's formed over the years. I mean, I know with my own children, as they was coming up through middle school, high school, and even in college, they would bring friends home that, for me, were questionable. But I'm like, come on in. You're welcome here. We love you. But, but what if I would have, you know, if I said, no, no, you can't go with that one. You can't hang out with this one. And, and you're trying to do the work of the harvest. How could you explain or justify the intentions of weeding them out? How could you explain that? I mean, this is just the truth of the world. You know, God's kingdom and the world are so intertwined. What the parable is saying here, you have to wait for the harvest. You have to wait. Now, do I like everybody that my adult kids now hang out with? Not necessarily. Am I happy with all the decisions they're making? No, not all of them. Do I feel like the world has some influence in them? Yes, it does. But I believe it would be worse for me to try to control their lives and tell them who they could hang out with, who they could see, who they could be friends with. I think that would be worse. i got to trust God with that. i got to trust that God is always working in their hearts, that He's always watching over them, that He's always speaking to them in those quiet moments. I can remember when I was not right with God for about a decade, I was so far out of His will, really about 15 years. I was just completely out of His will. But I'm going to tell you something, and I'd go to the parties, and I had the friends, and I was into all the trouble that most young people would get into. And it, but I'd go home at night, and there'd be quiet, still moments at night to where the conviction would come. And God would remind me that He's still near, that He's not going to let go of me because I prayed and asked Him into my heart as an eight-year-old boy. i got to trust God with the weeding. i got to trust God that He's going to take care of all this in time for harvest, and He's going to do the separating in the harvest. Why? Because waiting for the harvest gives hope. It gives hope. The, the wheat and the tares are a parable. Remember, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And here's the thing. In the parable, a wheat will never become a tare. But the spiritual significance is that that tare can become wheat. A, a lost person can become saved. A, a person can be rescued from that life of sin and they can become a follower of Christ. And so waiting for the harvest, we have that hope. You know, 2 Peter 3, 9 again, we read it earlier. The Lord is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so waiting for the harvest gives that hope that all would come to repentance. It's why we need to learn how to share our faith. Because before the harvest comes, we have the hope that anybody we speak to could possibly come to know Jesus as their Savior. Why? Because the harvest will be the reaping. It'll be the reaping. In verse 39, it goes on to say the harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. 
Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. Now think about this, the age. So the end of the age of grace that we're in. That's the age we're in. The age of grace. When you read the Old Testament, that was the age of the law. Why? Because Jesus hadn't come yet. And so people were expected to keep the law in anticipation of a Messiah to come. But now once Christ came and he died on the cross and he rose again and he paid for your sins and for my sins, now it's grace. Now it's grace. By grace are you saved through faith, not of works, not of keeping the law. Amen. And so here we are and we're in this age of grace. But what we're being warned is that the harvest is going to be at the end of the age and it's coming. The end of the age of grace is coming. And you know what it tells us at this point in the story? It says and there's only two endings. Only two. In the reaping, the sinful will be burned. Listen to verse 41. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend in those who practice lawlessness, the tares among us. And will cast them into a furnace of fire. There will be welling and gnashing of teeth. Now that's talking about a human experience. That's talking about the human tares. Those that have practiced lawlessness in their life. Those that have rejected the grace of Jesus Christ. It says that one day that they'll be separated and they'll be burned. And the Bible clearly expresses a place called hell. Preacher, do you believe in hell? Yes, I do. And I believe that nobody has to go there. It was originally created for Satan and his angels. But unfortunately, there's many humans that choose to follow him. Well, they can follow him right into hell. You say, well, do you believe that it's an eternal burning fire? Well, all I know is that's how it's described in the Bible. And I believe the Bible. And I often tell people this, if it's not a literal burning hell, then it's that bad or worse. And the only way it could be expressed in the Bible for us to understand is in those terms of a literal burning hell. There's so many terms, there's so many expressions, the worm that dies not. In other words, you have the memory of the many times you had to choose Christ and that memory just eats away and eats away and eats away. It talks about the loneliness of it. It talks about the pain of it. And and that might cause you to ask that question again. That question, well, if God's so good, why would He send anybody to hell? And you know the answer. He doesn't. He doesn't. He He has done everything in His power to let us all escape And so, you know what? When we choose to reject that, we're choosing our faith. God didn't send us to hell. We chose to go there. We chose to take that path. It's our choice. And you know what? Another thing about the reaping, the sinful will burn, but it also says in the reaping, the righteous will shine. Verse 43, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of the Father. The righteous will shine. Now it's time to respond. In verse 43, ends like this. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I hope that you've heard what I've been preaching this morning. Especially, I hope you've heard of the harvest and the reaping. The two destinations. I hope you've heard that. And I hope that you've made a decision already in your life. To shine in the kingdom of the Father by being His child. I hope you've made that decision. But unbelievers, I want to ask you, do you hear the warning of the judgment to come? How bad it's so bad that it's described in horrible terms as we just spoke of. No more hope. No more mercy. No more grace. Only the fiery judgment of a holy God is waiting at the harvest, at the reaping. 
Now is the period of grace. As long as we're living, as long as we're not standing before God, we're, we're still in this world, we're still under that grace, and we still have that opportunity to make a decision for Christ. So, believers, I'd ask you this question. Do you hear that call to shine? He says you'll shine in the Father's kingdom, but He wants you shining now. We know so many verses in the Bible says we're to be light. We're to shine and so I'd ask you this, how's your light shining? How's your light shining? What good works are you doing that glorifies the Father? Listen to Matthew five sixteen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You know how they glorify Him? They see your light shining, they see your good works, and they glorify Him by saying, I want what they have. They got Jesus, I want Jesus. That's your opportunity when we do Treat Street. That's your opportunity when we do M25 in November. That's your opportunity uh, to go into the elementary school and the middle school with the programs that are going on in there where they've opened their doors to us to go and shine. They're just saying, bring light into this place. There's so many opportunities for us to shine. But remember this, if you're not shining, you're sleeping. And while men slept. The enemy came in and sows his seeds. We can't afford to sleep, y'all. And so in this invitation time, I would just encourage you like this. I would say that if you're a believer and you thought about your light and you know it's not shining as brightly as it should, you probably need some repentance in your heart. I'm praying every day for my heart. I say, Lord, let there be repentance in my heart. Let there be a desire to be more like you and less like me. To be more faithful to you, to be more committed to you. And it's hard to do. I know it is. But I'm going to invite you to come to this altar today and bow and say, Lord, I want to make it public. I'm bowing before you now and I'm saying, let my light shine more. Show me how to shine more. Show me. Give me the inspiration I need to help with the school ministries. Give me the inspiration I need to help with the community ministries. We're going to be doing more of it. And it's because we know that we have to shine light in darkness. And so you need to come and make sure your heart is right with God that you're shining, that you're doing good work so that when people look at you, they'll glorify your Father in heaven. And most importantly, if you listen to this message and you realize that if, the, if, if Christ returned today, that you would be lost and you would be a tear and you would be separated away from God, then today's the day of salvation. If you feel Him tugging at your heart and you know you need to respond, I want to invite you to come forward and and just come to me and let's talk about that. Right here, right now, while you're feeling that tugging. Because you'll walk out those doors and you'll go to lunch and that'll subside. He won't just keep yelling at you. But right now, if He's speaking to you, you need to respond. So however God is speaking to your heart today, stand, let's sing and respond according to God's will for your life.